Section 44 of Library of the World's Best Literature, Ancient and Modern, Volume 1. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Kamna. Library of the World's Best Literature, Ancient and Modern, Volume 1, Section 44. Selection from Summer in Arcady by James Lane Allen James Lane Allen, 1850 to 1925 The literary work of James Lane Allen was begun with maturer powers and wider culture than most writers exhibit in their first publications. His mastery of English was acquired with difficulty, and his knowledge of Latin he obtained through years of instruction as well as of study. The wholesome open-air atmosphere which pervades his stories, their pastoral character and love of nature, come from the taste bequeathed to him by three generations of paternal ancestors, easy-going gentlemen farmers of the blue-grass region of Kentucky. On a farm near Lexington, in this beautiful country of stately homes, fine herds and great flocks, the author was born, and there he spent his childhood and youth. About 1885 he came to New York to devote himself to literature, for though he had contributed poems, essays, and criticisms to leading periodicals, his first important work was a series of articles descriptive of the Bluegrass region, published in Harper's Magazine. The field was new, the work was fresh, and the author's ability was at once recognized. Inevitably, he chose Kentucky for the scene of his stories, knowing and loving, as he did, her characteristics and her history. While preparing his articles on the Blue Glass region, he had studied the Trappist Monastery and the Convent of Loretto, as well as the records of the Catholic Church in Kentucky and his first stories, The White Cowl and Sister Dolorasa, which appeared in the Century magazine, were the first fruits of his labor. A controversy arose as to the fairness of these portraitures. But however opinions may differ as to his characterization, there can be no question of the truthfulness of the exposition of the medieval spirit of those retreats. This tendency to use a historic background marks most of Mr. Allen's stories. In The Coyer Invisible, a tale of the last century, Pioneer Kentucky once more exists. The old clergyman of flute and violin lived and died in Lexington, and had been long forgotten when his story touched the vanishing halo of a hard and saintly life. The old negro preacher with text embroiders on his coat tails was another figure of reality, unnoticed until he became one of the two gentlemen of Kentucky. In Lexington lived and died King Solomon, who had almost faded from memory when his historian found the record of the poor vagabond's heroism during the plague and made it memorable in a story that touches the heart and fills the eyes. A Kentucky Cardinal with Aftermath, its second part, is full of history and historic personages. Summer in Arcady, A Tale of Nature, the latest of Mr. Allen's stories, is no less based on local history and no less full of local color than his other tales, notwithstanding its general unlikeliness. This book sounds a deeper note than the earlier tales, although the truth which Mr. Allen sees is not mere fidelity to local types, but the essential truth of human nature. His realism has always been a poetic aspect. Quiet, reserved, out of the common, his books deal with moods rather than with actions. Their problems are spiritual rather than physical. Their thought tends towards the higher and more difficult way of life. A Courtship from Summer in Arcady The sunlight grew pale the following morning. A shadow crept rapidly over the blue. Bolts darted about the skies like maddened redbirds, the thunder ploughing its way down the dome as along zigzag cracks in the stony streets filled the caverns of the horizon with reverberations that shook the earth, and the rain was whirled across the landscape in long, white, wavering sheets. Then all day quiet and silence throughout nature, except for the drops tapping high and low the twinkling leaves, except for the new melody of woodland and meadow brooks, late silvery, 
and with a voice only for their pebbles and moss and mint, but now yellow and bowling, and leaping back into the grassy channels that were their old-time beds, except for the indoor music of dripping eyes and rushing cutters and overflowing rain barrels. And when at last, in the gold of the cool west, the sun broke from the edge of the grey, over what a green, soaked, fragrant world he reared the arc of nature's peace. Not a little blade of corn in the fields, but holds in an emerald vase its treasures of white gems. The hemp stalks bend so low under the weight of their plumes, that were a vesper of sparrow to alight on one for his evening hymn, it would go with him to the ground. The leaning barley and rye and wheat flash in the last rays their jewelled boyards. Under the old apple trees, golden brown mushrooms are already pushing upward through the leaf loam, rank with many an autumn's dropping. About the yards, the peonies fall with faces earthward. In the stable lots, the larded pokers, with bristles as green as frost and flesh of pinky whiteness, are hunting with nervous nostrils for the lush porcelain. The fowls are driving their bills up and down their west breasts, and the farmers who have been shelling corn for the mill come out of their barns, with their coats over their shoulders, on the way to supper, look about for the plow horses, and glance at the western sky, from which the last drops are falling. But soon, only a more passionate heat shoots from the sun into the planet. The plumes of the hemp are so dry again, that by the pollen shaken from their tops you can trace the young rabbits making their way out to the dusty paths. The shadows of white clouds sail over purple stretches of blue grass, hiding the sun from the steady eye of the turkey, whose brood is spread out before her like a fan on the earth. At early morning the neighing of the stallions is heard around the horizon. At noon the bull makes the deep, hot pastures echo with his majestic summons. Out in the blazing meadows the butterflies strike the afternoon air, with more impatient wings. Under the moon all night the play of ducks and drakes goes on along the margins of the ponds. Young people are running away and marrying. Middle-aged farmers surprise their wives by looking in on them at their butter-making in the sweet dairies. And nature is lashing everything, grass, fruit, insects, cattle, human creatures, more fiercely onward to the fulfillment of her ends. She is the great heartless haymaker, wasting not a ray of sunshine on a cloud, but caring not for the light that beats upon a throne, and holding man and woman with their longing for immortality, and their capacities for joy and pain, as of no more account than a couple of fertilizing nasturtiums. The storm kept Daphne at home. On the next day the earth was yellow with sunlight, but there were puddles along the path, and a branch rushing swollen across the green valley in the fields. On the third, her mother took the children fitted with hats and shoes, and Daphne also to be freshened up with various moderate adornments, in view of a procratic meeting soon to begin. On the fourth, some ladies dropped in to spend the day, bearing in mind the episode at dinner, and having grown curious to watch events accordingly. On the fifth, her father carried out the idea of cutting down some cedar trees in the front yard for friends' posts, and whenever he was working at, about the house, he kept her near to wait on him in unnecessary ways. On the sixth, he rode away with two hands and an empty wagon bed for some work on the farm. Her mother drove off to another dinner. Dinners never cease in Kentucky, and the wife of an elder is not free to decline invitations. And at last she was left alone on the front porch. Her face turned with burning eagerness towards the fields. In a little while she had slipped away. All these days Hilary had been eager to see her. He was carrying a good many girls in his mind that summer, none in his heart, but his plans concerning these latter were of the time forgotten. He hung about that part of his form from which he could have descried her in the distance. Each forenoon and afternoon, at the usual hour of her going to the uncle's, he rode over and watched for her. Other people passed to and fro, children and servants, but not Daphne, and repeated disappointments fanned his desire to see her. When she came into sight at last, he was soon walking beside her, leading his horse by the reins. "'I have been waiting to see you, Daphne,' he said with a smile, but general air of seriousness. "'I have been waiting a long time for a chance to talk to you.' 
"'And I have wanted to see you,' said Daphne, her face turned away, and her voice hardly to be heard. "'I have been waiting for a chance to talk to you.' The change in her was so great, so unexpected. It contained an appeal to him so touching, that he glanced quickly at her. Then he stopped short and looked searchingly around the meadow. The thorn tree is often the only one that can survive on these pasture lands. Its spikes, even when it is no higher than the grass, keep off the mouths of grazing stock. As it grows higher, birds see it standing solitary in the distance and fly to it, as a resting place in passing. Some autumn day a seed of the wild grape is thus dropped near its root, and in time the thorn tree and the grape vine come to thrive together. As Hilary now looked for some shade to which they could retreat from the binding burning sunlight, he saw one of these standing off at a distance of a few hundred yards. He slipped the bridle reins to the head stall, and giving his mare a soft slap on the shoulder, turned her loose to graze. "'Come over here and sit down out of the sun,' he said, starting off in his authoritative way. "'I want to talk to you.' Daphne followed in his wake through the deep grass. When they reached the tree, they sat down on the rayless boughs. Some sheep lying there ran around to the other side and stood watching them with a frightened look in their clear, peaceful eyes. "'What's the matter?' he said, fanning his face, and tugging with his forefinger to loosen his shirt collar from the moist snakes. He had the manner of a powerful comrade whose means to succour a weaker one. "'Nothing,' said Daphne, like a true woman. "'Yes, but there is,' he insisted. I got you into trouble. I didn't think of that when I asked you to dance. You had nothing to do with it, retorted Daphne, with a flash. I danced for spite. He threw back his head with a peal of laughter. All at once this was broken off. He sat up, with his eyes fixed on the lower edge of the meadow. Here comes your father, he said gravely. Daphne turned. Her father was riding slowly through the bars. A wagon bed loaded with rails crept slowly after him. In an instant the things that had cost her so much toil, and so many tears to arrange, her explanations, her justifications, and her parting, all the reserve and the coldness that she had laid up in her heart, as one fills high a little ice-house with fear of far off summer heat, all were quite gone, melted away, and everything that he had planned to tell her was forgotten also at the sight of that stone figure on horseback bearing unconsciously down upon them. If I had only kept my mouth shut about his old fences, he said to himself, confound my bull, and he looked anxiously at Daphne, who sat with her eyes riveted on her father. The next moment she had turned, and they were laughing in each other's faces. What shall I do? she cried, leaning over and burying her face in her hands, and lifting it again, scarlet with excitement. Don't do anything, he said calmly. But Hilary, if he sees us, we are lost. If he sees us, we are found. But he mustn't see me here, she cried, with something like real terror. I believe I'll lie down in the grass. Maybe he'll think I'm a friend of yours. My friends all sit up in the grass, said Hilary. But Daphne had already hidden. Many a time, when a little girl, she had amused herself by screaming like a hawk at the young guineas, and seeing them cuddle her invisible under small tufts and weeds. Out in the stable yard, where the grass was grazed so close that the geese could barely nip it, she would sometimes get one of them negro men to scare the little pigs, for the delight of seeing them squat, as though hidden, when they were no more hidden than if they were spread themselves upon so many dinner dishes, all of us revealed traces of this primitive instinct upon occasion. Daphne was doing her best to hide now. When Hilary realized it, he moved in front of her, screening her as well as possible. "'Hadn't you better lie down, too?' she asked. "'No,' he replied quickly. "'But if he sees you, he might take a notion to ride over this way. "'Then he'll have to ride. "'But, Hilary, suppose he were to find me lying down here beside you, hiding. "'Then he'll have to find you. "'You get me into trouble, and then you won't help me out,' exclaimed Daphne with considerable heat. "'It might not make matters any better for me to hide,' he answered quietly. "'But he, if he comes over here and tries to get us into trouble,' I'll see then what I can do. Daphne lay silent for, mo for a moment, thinking. Then she nestled more closely down, and said with a gay, unconscious archness, I am not hiding because I am afraid of him. I am doing it just because I want to. 
she did not know that the fresh happiness flushing her at that moment came from the fact of having hilary between herself and her father as a protector that she was drinking in the delight a woman feels in getting playfully behind the man she loves in the face of danger but her action bound her to him and brought her more under his influence his words showed that he also felt his position the position of the male who stalks forth from the herd and stands a silent challenger he was young and vain of his manhood in the usual innocent way that led him to carry the chip on his shoulder for the world to knock off and he placed himself before daphne with the understanding that if they were discovered they would be in trouble her father was a violent man and the circumstances were not such that any kentucky father would overlook them but with his inward seriousness his face wore its usual look of reckless unconcern is he coming this way asked daphne after an interval of impatient waiting straight ahead are you hit i can't see whether i'm hit or not where is he now right on us does he see you yes do you think he sees me i'm sure of it then i might as well get up said daphne with the courage of despair and up she got her father was riding along the path in front of them but not looking she was down again like a partridge how could you fool me hilary suppose he had been looking i wonder what he thinks i'm doing sitting over here on the grass like a stump said hilary if he takes me for one he must think i've got an awful lot of roots tell me when it's time to get up i will he turned softly toward her she was lying on her side with her burning cheek in one hand the other hand rested high on the curve of her hip her braids had fallen forward and lay in a heavy hoop about her lovely shoulders her eyes were closed her scarlet lips parted in a smile the edges of her snow-white petticoats showed beneath her blue dress and beyond these one of her feet and ankles nothing more fragrant with innocence ever lay on the grass is it time to get up now not yet and he sat bending over her now not yet he replied more softly now then not for a long time his voice thrilled her and she glanced up at him his laughing eyes were glowing up down upon her under his heavy mat of hair she sat up and looked towards the wagon crawling away in the distance her father was no longer in sight one of the ewes dissatisfied with the back view stamped her forefoot impatiently and ran around in front and out into the sun her lambs followed and three raising themselves abreast stared at daphne with a look of helpless inquiry shh she cried throwing up her hands at them irritated go away she turned they turned and ran the others followed and the whole number falling into line took a path meekly homeward they left a greater sense of privacy under the tree several rods off was a small stock pond around the edge of this the water stood hot and green in the tracks of the cattle and the sheep and about these pools the yellow butterflies were thick alighting daintily on the promontories of the mud or rising two by two to the dazzling atmosphere in columns of enamoured flight daphne leaned over to the blue grass where it swayed unbroken in the breeze and drew out of their sockets several stalks of it bearing on their tops the purplish seed vessels with them she began to braid a ring about one of her fingers in the old simple fashion of the country as they talked he lay propped up on his elbow watching her fingers the soft flow movements of which little by little wove a spell over his eyes and once again the power of her beauty began to draw him beyond control he felt a desire to seize her hands to crush them in his his eyes passed upward up along her tapering wrists the skin of which was like mother of pearl upward along the arm to the shoulder to her neck too her deeply crimson cheeks to the purity of her brow to the purity of her eyes the downcast lashes of which hid them like conscious fringes an awkward silence began to fall between them daphne felt at that time had come for her to speak but powerless to begin she feigned to busy herself all the more devotedly with braiding the deep green circlet suddenly he drew himself to the grass to her side let me no she cried lifting her arm above his reach and looking at him with a gay threat you don't know how i do know how he said with his white teeth on his red underlip and his eyes sparkling and reaching upward he laid his hand on in the hollow of her elbow and pulled her arm down no no she cried again putting her hands behind her back you will spoil it i will not spoil it he said moving so close to her 
that his breath was on her face, and reaching round to unclasp her hands. "'No, no, no!' she cried, bending away from him. "'I don't want any ring!' and she tore it from her finger and threw it out in the grass. Then she got up, and brushing the grass seed off her lap, put on her hat. He sat cross legged on the grass before her. He had put on his hat, and the brim hid his eyes. "'And you are not going to stay and talk to me?' he said in a tone of reproachfulness, without looking up. She was excited and weak and trembling, and so she put out her hand and took hold of the strong loop of grapevine hanging from a branch of the thorn, and laid her cheek against her hand and looked away from him. "'I thought you were better than the others,' he continued, with bitter wisdom of twenty years. "'But you women are all alike. When a man gets into trouble, you desert him. You hurry him on to the devil. I have been turned out of the church, and now you are down on me. Oh, well! But you know how much I have always liked you, Daphne.' It was not the first time he had acted this character. It had been a favourite role. But Daphne had never seen the like. She was overwhelmed with happiness that he cared so much for her, and to have him reproach her for indifference, and see him suffering with the idea that she had turned her against him, that instantly changed the whole situation. He had not heard then what had taken place at the dinner. Under the circumstances, feeling certain that the secret of her love had not been discovered, she grew emboldened to risk a little more. So she turned toward him, smiling, and swayed gently as she clung to the vine. "'Yes, I have my orders not to even speak to you, never again,' she said, with the air of tantalizing. "'Then stay with me a while now,' he said, and lifted slowly to her his appealing face. She sat down and screened herself with a little feminine transparency. "'I can't stay long. It's going to rain.' He cast a wicked glance at the sky from under his hat. There were a few clouds on the horizon. "'And so you're never going to speak to me again?' he said mournfully. "'Never. How delicious her laughter was. I'll put a ring on your finger to remember me by.' He lay over in the grass and pulled several stalks. Then he lifted his eyes beseechingly to hers. "'Will you let me?' Daphne hid her hands. He drew himself to her side and took one of them forcibly from her lap. With a slow, caressing movement, he began to braid the grass ring around her finger, in and out, around and around, his fingers laced with her fingers, his palm lying close upon her palm, his blood tingling through her skin upon her blood. He made the braiding go wrong, and took it off and begin over again. Two or three times she drew a deep breath, and stole a bewildered look at his face, which was so close to hers that his hair brushed it, so close that she heard the quiver of his own breath. Then all at once he folded his hands about her with a quick, fierce tenderness, and looked up at her. She turned her face aside and tried to draw her hand away. His glass tightened. She snatched it away and got up with a nervous laugh. "'Look at the butterflies! Aren't they pretty?' He sprang up and tried to seize her hand again. "'You shan't go home yet,' he said in an undertone. "'Shan't I?' said she, backing away from him. "'Who's going to keep me?' "'I am,' he said, laughing excitedly and following her closely. "'My father's coming,' she cried out as a warning. He turned and looked. There was no one in sight. "'He is coming, sooner or later,' she called. She had retreated several yards off into the sunlight of the meadow. The remembrance of the risk that he was causing her to run checked him. He went over to her. "'When can I see you again? Soon?' He had never spoken so seriously to her before. He had never been before so serious. But within the last hour nature had been doing her work, and its effect was immediate. His sincerity instantly conquered her. Her eyes fell. "'No one has any right to keep us from seeing each other,' he insisted. "'We must settle that for ourselves.' Daphne made no reply. "'But we can't meet here any more with people passing backward and forward.' He continued rapidly and decisively. What has happened today mustn't happen again. No, she replied in a voice barely to be heard. It must never happen again. We can't meet here. They were walking side by side now, toward the meadow path. As they reached it, he paused. Come to the back of the pasture tomorrow at four o'clock, he said tentatively, recklessly. Daphne did not answer as she moved away from him along the path homeward. Will you come? he called out to her. She turned and shook her head. Whatever her own new plans may have become, she was once more happy and laughing. "'Come, Daphne!' 
She walked several paces further, and turned and shook her head again. Come, he pleaded. She laughed at him. He wheeled round to his mare, grazing near. As he put his foot into the stirrup, he looked again. She was standing in the same place, laughing still. You go, she cried, waving him good-bye. There'll not be a soul to disturb you. Tomorrow at four o'clock. Will you be there, he said. Will you, she answered. I'll be there tomorrow, he said, and every other day till you come. End of section 44 Recording by Kamna